Uh, welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and we are continuing to broadcast uh, interviews that are uh, created remotely, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to be able to go back to in-person uh, visits again in the future. But I'm very happy today um, to have uh, the opportunity to talk to Peter Millman. He is an architect uh, back with a background of city planning, toy invention and real estate, and has also been active for many years in PACE, People's Action for Clean Energy, and the Eastern Connecticut uh, Green Action Group uh, up in the Mansfield Willimantic area. And Peter is going to talk about community energy and um, he actually was supposed to come onto the show in person in March, uh, the first of our COVID related cancellations. So we're glad to have him back here. Uh, welcome, Peter. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's taken a while for us to get together, but uh, between COVID and everything else, uh, it's understandable why it took so long. Um, but, but, you know, this issue doesn't go away. It's still really as relevant or more relevant than it was, you know, eight months ago. So uh, I'm glad to be able to, you know, see your presentation. And uh, I know you have a, a PowerPoint. So if you want to go to it, that's fine. And I'll interject questions if I have them. Okay, just what, just one slight correction. I, I am not an architect, oh. but I have a background in architecture. It's oh. been a long time since I did any architecture. I'm <laughs> okay. retired at this point. Point taken, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so, oops. Yeah, so here we are. Um, Rona, should I just get started? Sure, I would say just get started. Okay, so again, thanks Rona and um, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to speak to you and to all of you. Um, and I'm, we'll put this up on YouTube afterwards so it can be uh, disseminated more widely as well. Terrific. Um, so I'm, the policy that I'm going to be speaking about today is called um, Community Power for Connecticut. Uh, it's not solar, it's not community solar. Um, it's something different. And just in terms of terminology, the generic and original term for this policy tool is, is community choice aggregation or CCA. Uh, but an emerging uh, term is community power, which uh, is being used in New Hampshire, the newest uh, community power state. And um, it kind of differentiates this, the newer, more advanced form of community choice from, um, from the older and a more limited form. Anyways, that'll all make a little more sense later, I hope. So uh, community power is a tool for local government to reduce the cost of electricity, lower greenhouse gas emissions and increase resiliency for all of the municipalities, residents and businesses. Um, just to sort of, to set the stage we here in Connecticut need to shift the way we think about the power sector. Uh, and to explain some of this, myself and a friend and associate, Samuel Golding from New Hampshire, uh, wrote this uh, opinion piece for the Connecticut Mirror called, uh, and we titled it, Connecticut Needs to Make Big Changes in Who Does What in the Electric Power Industry. And the main point we were trying to make is that there is then we need to shift our thinking about what the role of utilities are and what the roles of more local decision-making should be here in Connecticut. Uh, utilities have historically um, done a bunch of different functions, but the only one that they really need to be a monopoly for is to own and operate the distribution system. That is the poles and wires and transformers and uh, substations that deliver power from uh, generation to us users. 
uh, but they do other things that they don't have to be um, that, that they don't have to be doing, and that other entities uh, could be doing better. So here's a simple uh, definition of community power. There are other definitions. It's a municipal authority that allows local governments to become the default provider of electricity services and supply to their residents and businesses. Utilities continue to own and operate the distribution grid. To make uh, this even uh, more understandable, uh, it's, it may be useful to go back to 1998 when Connecticut deregulated its power sector, um, as did a, a number of other states, about a dozen and a half states in that same time period did the same thing, um, separating the supply function from the delivery function, supply or generation it might be called. So you can see the, um, uh, the results of this on our bills today, where there is a supplier part of the bill uh, and there is a delivery part of the bill. So you right now as an individual, uh, can choose who your supplier is going to be, uh, whether it will be one of any number of competitive suppliers who uh, offer that service, uh, or whether you want to get your supply from the utility. But you don't have any choice about who's going to deliver your, your electricity. It's going to be uh, Eversource or um, UI or your municipal utility. Uh, and it's this deregulation that forms the basis for uh, community power, where instead of you and me as uh, individual residents of a municipality um, choosing a utility or a competitive supplier, which has its problems, um, we can instead come together as a community and with some professional assistance, make a better choice of who's going to be our supplier of electricity. And um, it has other benefits also. And I can't help uh, but notice that uh, delivery costs more than supply, which is, I don't know if that totally makes sense or not, but uh, it, it, it's interesting to see that that's the case. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, that was one of my old, old bills. And uh, sometimes it does. It's worth noting that for small businesses and large businesses, um, there's a third component of the bill called the demand charge. Um, and that that demand charge, which is reflecting the, the greatest amount of power that uh, business or, in, or, or institutional entity needs at, for any given month or other times during the year, that demand charge can be a tremendous part of the bill. It can be a, a quarter, a third, or even a half of the bill. And we as, we as residents are a little bit insulated from that demand Part, but we're paying for it anyways. And uh, that's another component of uh, thinking about changing the power sector or at least uh, yeah, adjusting to it. So here's a, a, a little graphic that says uh, what our current electricity choices are right now in Connecticut. Uh, right now, uh, you can choose your utility to be the supplier of electricity um, through their default offering or you can choose a third party or competitive supplier. And this, this is actually kind of reflects, at least in Eversource territory, the roughly the proportion for residential users, about 80% to 20%, although that has fluctuated over the years. In, in a community power uh, model, uh, the community power agency, that CPA, becomes the default offering. So a municipality would go through a, a lengthy process, an open process um, that might take a year or two. And if at the end of that process of considering whether to create a community power agency or not, um, the, municipal, the municipality's uh, legislative body, so town council or board of selectmen, decided to create the power uh, the uh, community power agency, then that community power agency would uh, start the process of becoming the default offering entity for all uh, residential and businesses, except those who at that time are getting their power from uh, third party suppliers. And typically that default offering will be at the same price or less than what the utility is offering and offer uh, at least as much um, 
uh, recs or, or at least as much clean energy content in terms of renewable energy certificates as does the utility, which is uh, both would be governed by the renewable portfolio standard of Connecticut. But you do have more choices. So you could, you're automatically enrolled if this all happens in your municipality in the new community power agency's default offering. But if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. You can opt out, you can go back to the utilities default offering, or you can go to the third party supplier, to a third party supplier. You can also opt up uh, to, uh, sometimes a community power agency will offer a, an, an option that has more renewable energy contents. Here I've called it 100% renewable and you pay a little bit more for that. And then third party supplier customers can opt in when their contracts are up. So another way to look at this is these competing models of uh, how the electricity sector is organized. So over on the left, uh, where the blue boxes are, so over here, um, there is what we're used to thinking about where the investor owned utility, unless you're in a municipal utility territory, does three things in this highly simplified graph, graphic. Um, the utility goes out and procures power on your behalf. It also owns and operates the distribution system and it does customers facing programs and services like meter reading and rate design. It may administer uh, energy and um, energy efficiency programs and demand response programs, but it's a very in, it utility dependent model. And that's what most of the 20th century has been uh, in most of the country and, and, and about the turn of this last century, uh, things began to change. Now community power was developed first in Massachusetts in 1997. And in that original and more limited view of community power or community choice in that in the middle column, uh, the community power agency simply takes over the procurement of power, but the utility continues to do uh, the two things of owning and operating the distribution lines and do all customer facing services. Um, there's merit to this, but there are also problems. And one problem is it's just very limited in, in what it's going to affect. So in this model, uh, a municipality forms a community power agency. It hires a broker who then goes out and tries to get a better deal than the utility is offering, a somewhat lower price and offering uh, some additional renewable energy certificates. And that's pretty much the end of it. Um, in the more advanced form of community power, which is on the right, uh, the community power agency takes on the task of procuring power. Uh, utility continues to own and operate the distribution lines. But in addition, the community power agency uh, takes over the reading and operation of the meters, uh, particularly uh, advanced smart meters begins to innovate in terms of rate design and customer programs and may become the administrator for energy efficiency programs and demand response programs and uh, other things. So there are these competing models. And for my money, I think that we should, that Connecticut should be looking at the model on the right-hand side, the more advanced form, which is practiced a lot in California a bit in uh, New York and Massachusetts, and is definitely uh, the way things are rolling uh, out in New Hampshire. Thinking about things like, uh, you know, lobbying clout, um, are the utility companies uh, more likely to fight tooth and nail against the, you know, right hand model? Uh, that empowers them less than uh, the middle model? Or does it not really matter if the political will is there? Um, I think that, that maybe they would uh, uh, fight more on, uh, for the more advanced, against the more advanced model. Uh, they, the, the California utilities, investor owned utilities for, for tooth and nail uh, for close to a decade, uh, trying to do everything they could to stop community power or community choice aggregation in California. Um, 
they don't want to give up control um, and uh, that they're, they're not particularly cooperative in New Hampshire as things are rolling out. Um, yeah. So here, so here is community power in across the United States. And as I said, it began in Massachusetts in 1997. Uh, the inventor is a guy named Paul Fenn, who's still active. Um, and then it was adopted in a number of other states over the last two decades. New Hampshire is the most recent uh, community power state. Um, and for my money, uh, there's a lot to learn from each of these uh, states. But Massachusetts and California and New Hampshire are the most interesting states. And I think that what we really should be looking at is New Hampshire because it imported the more advanced model into a small New England state, uh, which is of course what we are. I see that many of our surrounding states are ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, now remember, uh, Massachusetts largely is, uh, is um, using the more, uh, the more limited model. R Rhode Island seems to be going in that direction. New York is a bit of a hybrid and it's, I think it's still evolving. I mean, all of the states are still evolving, uh, but New Hampshire is definitely trying to uh, take the bull by the horns on, uh, on, uh, on community power. And before you leave this slide, I wanted to ask, what would you consider a low barrier and what would be considered a high barrier? Good question. Um, low barrier is uh, states that have already deregulated. In other words, that have already separated uh, the supply or generation function of a utility from the delivery function of the utility. Uh, at one of the earlier slides, I tried to get at that. In other words, once the step from go going from individuals and businesses or in a deregulated state where individuals and businesses, and again, there are variations around the country, but uh, already allowed to choose their own supplier. Well, the step towards um, community power is a lot easier because this is just another form of choosing. In the other states where, there, where deregulation has not taken place, where its uh, utilities are vertically integrated and can, are still allowed to own uh, generation facilities, it's, it, it's more difficult. There are more difficult regulatory and I might even say cultural um, um, barriers. Okay. So let's go a little deeper into why, why should we really bother with community power? And it turns out there are some pretty good reasons. One is local control itself. Um, local control, democracy, it's a pretty good thing. Um, and in this new era of a decentralized grid uh, where power flows in two directions and where there are many sources of generation and uh, distributed energy resources uh, are and should play a greater role, uh, there's a need to make to allow decision making at more local at a more local level, uh, and I think the community power agencies created by uh, municipalities are that decision making body that should be doing it. And that's instead of so many decisions being made by utilities and their regulators. So local control is a big um, advantage here, setting priorities and finding solutions at community scale. Uh, market innovation is important. We need to do things faster and better than we are now. Um, as Bill McKibben has said, um, winning slowly is the same as losing. We need to do this better quickly. And why in the world would you ask a, a, a monopoly utility to do innovative programs and initiatives uh, when that's not in their culture, frankly? Uh, and there's another reason too, which is that to some degree, there is a conflict of interest, which is that what utilities uh, earn their revenues from, and, and rightfully so, is uh, really owning and maintaining that infrastructure. And the more that's spent on infrastructure, the more money they make. Um, some of that is definitely useful and necessary, but our interest as ratepayers is to spend as little as possible on, on, on infrastructure 
and using uh, distributed energy resources, that is distributed generation like solar and to some degree wind and energy efficiency programs and demand response and microgrids, the more that we do that, the less we need to spend money on the grid. So there's this conflict of interest. And just to talk a little bit more about market innovation, here are some uh, areas where we need to do things better and where community power agencies can have a role uh, in, in better customer service, uh, better energy efficiency programs, which can mean uh, connecting customers with state and federal programs, but also developing local incentives. Um, metering and rate design is an area ripe for innovation where uh, we need to move more towards uh, what's sometimes called AMI, advanced meter infrastructure, which is smart meters, uh, which would allow all sorts of innovate um, in turn, in, including uh, real-time rates on an opt-in basis, that is time of use rates, which has all sorts of uh, benefits. One of the benefits falls actually within the realm of demand response and load flexibility programs. So if you have rates that uh, reward uh, the use of energy uh, when prices are not uh, so high, uh, then there are, there are real advantages. In other words, demand response and load flexibility programs are trying to lower the peak demand uh, within a, a, a region and also shift that peak demand away from times when wholesale energy is really expensive and towards times when it's less expensive. And there are a number of ways of doing that, you know, uh, bundling together smart uh, appliances and, and smart thermostats is, is, is one way. Um, Distributed energy resources and integrating individual uh, installations is a big place we have to move towards. Uh, you know, and that includes things like uh, more, more distributed solar, uh, more net uh, metering, battery storage, electrified heating, and actually instead of manage EV infrastructure, I think that electrifying transportation is a broader uh, way of talking about this. Um, and it's not just individual installations, but binding those together, coordinating them to get more benefit, financial benefit and emissions benefit for both uh, individual ratepayers and for communities and the grid as a whole. Uh, and finally, resilience is a place where we need to, to innovate. A lot of this has to do with uh, simply distributing uh, energy resources uh, uh, that that has a form of resilience in and of itself, but also microgrids and the siting of new developments uh, can, can do that. Now, going back to what uh, you had, uh, your quote from Bill McKibben, it does seem as though there's more uh, urgency than ever to uh, put some of these innovations into practice. Right, and I, and I want to uh, make it clear that utilities still have a, have, have a role to play and some of the utilities are doing a better job than others in uh, adopting and hastening the uh, deployment of distributed energy resources. But my contention and the experience uh, in California is that community power agencies can assist that uh, and do a better job really. So lower prices, who doesn't like lower prices? Um, and that's partly through uh, uh, community power agencies can get uh, that partly through uh, competing with utilities uh, that has value in and of itself, more competition, less monopoly power. But by having uh, a portfolio, by controlling its own portfolio of wholesale energy contracts, and, and uh, uh, managing costs and managing risks. And of course, doing all of that with professional expertise and help. A community can become much more in touch with the drivers of cost. Now, some drivers of cost like uh, FERC rulings, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission rulings, we don't have a lot to do with. Um, I'm not saying we can't uh, try to have something to do with it, but that's at a very different scale. But shifting peak demand, shifting, um, lowering peak demand, all of that can lower the demand profile of our communities in a way that then go, makes it less expensive to go out and uh, procure, uh, procure electricity on behalf of the community. 
Equity and economic development are a key part of all of this. Um, we need to be thinking about how to distribute both the benefits and the costs of decarbonization equitably. And one of the benefits of decarbonization uh, can be the creation of jobs because somebody's going to put in all this distributed uh, solar and battery storage uh, and energy efficiency is a very labor intensive process, but has to be done. Um, tax revenues are economic development benefit, uh, both by increasing the number of jobs and, and how well people are paid. There's an income tax benefit to state and local governments, but also as properties are improved through energy efficiency um, uh, programs, uh, property becomes uh, more valuable and can be taxed uh, for greater revenue. There are health benefits uh, by improving indoor air quality through energy efficiency measures, which can be part of that, and uh, uh, electrifying transportation. The, there are health benefits from in, improving indoor and outdoor air quality. And of course, if a community chooses to lower rates, uh, then there's economic benefit there also. It seems to me that a lot of, uh, you know, Connecticut's economy is quite dependent on just a few industries right now. And some of those industries like, you know, in Southeast Connecticut, the building of submarines, um, I don't see those being sustainable in, you know, industries 10, 15, 20, 30 years into the future. And it seems as though this is one way we can preemptively like start creating new job creator, you no know, crop job centers uh, that aren't uh, based on what we needed 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Right. I mean, uh, we need to make this, we need to make this transition to a cleaner economy and uh, wind turbines offshore and uh, lots and lots of distributed generation um, is certainly one of the ways in energy efficiency. That's the way that we're going to, um, to, to do it. And so decarbonization is last, but very much not least, as a matter of fact, it may be the most important aspect of all of this. And, and one of the benefits of the more um, advanced form of community power is that it can have an effect, not just in the realm of energy generation, but in building decarbonization and transportation uh, decarbonization through electrification. And each of these are big topics in and of themselves, but uh, this, is an, this is an overview of it all. So if a community creates a community power agency, uh, it's not meant to work alone. We're not creating uh, individual fiefdoms, silos. Uh, community power agencies are meant to partner with each other and do in, in other states, in some of the other states. They can work with each other. Sometimes, first for one thing, municipalities can uh, work together to actually create a community power agency. It can uh, cover more than one municipality. But even if uh, it, we in Connecticut uh, form many Single municipality community, single municipality community power agencies. Uh, they can form a joint power agency uh, that is the back office that can provide a lot of the expertise needed uh, and services needed, particularly by what will be smaller community power agencies. Uh, utilities uh, need to partner with, um, with uh, community power agencies to modernize the grid, say for by uh, hastening the uh, installation and smart use of smart meters. Community power agencies uh, should be working with other state agencies like uh, the Green Bank and the Energy Efficiency Board and DEEP, the uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and Pura, um, uh, the Public Utility Regulatory Authority. And finally, community power agencies can also work with other parts of their own local government because planning and zoning decisions can have an effect on the demand profile of a community. And those decisions should be informed by that effect. 
So just a, a quick graphic here of what a, uh, what a joint power agency will look like. Uh, this is uh, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, they are in the process of forming community power in New Hampshire. There are more than four municipalities, but just to um, our uh, governmental entities. But just to give you a sense, uh, here are four of them and they will uh, contribute funds to creating community power in New Hampshire and uh, which as, as I say, will provide some of the back office expertise to help the individual municipalities um, uh, carry out their plans and, and programs. Just by the way, that community power in New Hampshire or the Joint Power Agency can also become a force for advocacy. Uh, it can help inform pure and deep and the legislature what the barriers are to doing their job better. And so I think that the, uh, that community power has the possibility through the many people who would be, in, be involved with advisory boards uh, and other committees uh, of increasing the number and the knowledgeability, if that's the right word, um, of uh, clean energy advocates in Connecticut. Uh, oops, excuse me. Here in Connecticut, uh, over the last year or two, uh, the, there's a coalition that's been growing, uh, backing uh, community choice aggregation. I was more calling it CCA back then. Um, and here are some of the organizations that have uh, signed on to support community choice. Um, I spent time uh, collaborating with uh, Dan Knudsen from uh, Cheshire and uh, Mike Yule from New Haven and Kathy Fay and other people. Uh, there's been a real group effort towards involving other organizations. Uh, we've talked to a whole bunch of uh, legislators and here are some of the legislators who have voiced support, at least that, that, that we could use their name. Um, so there's a, uh, there is some uh, presence in the legislature of uh, supportive legislators. And finally, uh, we were, we reached out to municipalities and asked them to pass resolutions uh, supporting community choice aggregation. And here are the towns that went through the process of having their clean energy task force or sustainability first pass a, the resolution and then sending it on to their legislative body, their town council or board of selectmen or something. And so uh, pretty impressive array of towns, uh, Middletown, New Haven, Simsbury, Mansfield, and Wyndham. And this is a key part of what I think we need to do more of going forward. Thinking about New London, uh, do you have bill language that you can just share to uh, you know, make the process easier? It, it seems like at least in my town, uh, it probably would not be difficult to pass a resolution. Well, I'm glad you said that. And, you know, I, yes, we do have a sample resolution and all of these towns used a sample resolution and then um, amended it as they saw fit or in some cases did not amend it. Uh, but yes, I, I definitely want to talk more about that. And just in general, uh, it's hard to talk about this stuff. Um, and so in each of these cases, either I or Mike or Dan uh, made a presentation to the Clean Energy Task Force or similar committee uh, where they discussed and then passed a re the resolution and then sent it on to the legislative body of the municipality. And in some cases, like I spoke before the Simsbury uh, Board of Selectmen and also the Mansfield Town Council. Uh, I think I also spoke in front of the uh, Wyndham Town Council. So, uh, you know, every place will do it a little bit differently, but we're here to help. I'm here to help and others can help also. I think you have communicated with the New London Sustainability Committee, but it has not uh, gotten as far as city council yet, I don't think. But uh, I don't think it would be a stretch. Okay, then we need to talk more about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, another source of, of recent uh, support has been from the Governor's Council on Climate Change. Their mitigation working group e recently issued um, their final report and among the many references to community choice, um, here's one, 
it says Pure's docket, that is Public Utility Regulatory's docket, um, could result in legislation to bring this tool to Connecticut as a means of increasing local involvement, targeting efficiency dollars based on local imperatives, accelerating deployment of distributing energy resources, and increasing options for municipal procurement of green energy. So I was very pleased with uh, their support. Now the pure docket that they're referring to is that um, back in March, the Energy and Technology Committee and had a slate of about, I don't remember, 30 or so bills that they were considering. One of them was a bill that would have directed DEEP to do a study of CCA. And uh, of course, COVID came and disrupted that whole process and none of those bills really went anywhere. Uh, as a result, and, and various discussions I had, I eventually in May uh, submitted a petition to the Public Utility Regulatory Authority and said, would you be willing to do a study of community choice? And uh, late in May, they said yes. And so uh, over the past several months, there have been three technical meetings and 30 interrogatories and other questions requiring public comment, which is one of the reasons that the effort to get more municipal resolutions has somewhat stalled. Um, but it was a lot of work. And I just found out yesterday that the draft report is tentatively going to be released on January 14th, I think it is. And then there'll be a, a week or so for public comment. And the final report is tentatively going to be issued early in February. So looking forward to, uh, I'm hoping that that will be a supportive uh, re report. So where do we go from here? Uh, I, I think I would amend this, this graphic. Uh, one, uh, before passing municipal resolutions, I think the next uh, step really is for me to write a, um, a letter to the Energy and Technology Committee saying that there is a lot of support for community choice, community power here in Connecticut. Uh, legislators, uh, organizations, environmental and clean energy organizations, uh, municipalities, uh, um, the GC3, I'm hoping, uh, Pura, and that uh, we will hope that the Energy and Technology Committee will take a very close and supportive look at uh, community power this session. Uh, a little more, uh, uh, another part of this is passing municipal resolutions, which I, um, which I mentioned. And then I think it's getting to be time to form some kind of a community power Connecticut organization to promote uh, the establishment or the enabling, um, the passing of enabling legislation and eventually to, um, you know, once enabling legislation is passed to form community power agencies. Uh, so this is a, a highly simplified view. I wanna mention one other thing that, which is that at this point, we just want the enabling legislation to pass, which will give municipalities the opportunity to think through whether this is something they want to do and it, whether it will benefit them. But passing enabling legislation obligates no one to do anything. Um, but I think uh, uh, there will be a good uh, number of municipalities that want to proceed. So I'll just leave you with that uh, legacy thinking will not serve legacy problems and that the over-reliance over on a utility dominated energy sector is not going to solve the problems that we need to, at least not in enough time to solve the problems that climate change poses to us. So thank you very much. And I would be happy to take your questions, Rona. And I, I just wanna mention that uh, Samuel Golding, among many other people, has been a particular help in, uh, I really couldn't have done this far without his help. And also um, uh, uh, Mike Ewell and Dan Knudsen, um, Kathy Fay and others. Well, thank you. Um, and I guess we can stop screen sharing, although you had a couple other uh, slides that I got to look at. Um, you mentioned in, in some of the slides, I think, um, and maybe in, in your uh, what you said about shared solar, um, has there been 
um, a lot of shared solar activity in Connecticut uh, so far. I've heard it talked about quite a lot. Yeah, well, shared solar sometimes called community sh uh, solar. It, it's actually in here. I think it's called shared clean energy facilities. Um, has sort of a unhappy history. It's it, I think we're getting close to uh, rolling it out. But there was a um, there was a recommendation that uh, well there was a pilot program. Even though uh, many were saying there's no need to do a pilot program. Um, so this was a few years ago uh, because other states have proven that community solar is a, a good way to go and it's uh, pretty well understood. Nevertheless, Connecticut uh, went with a, a pilot program. The first iteration of the pilot program uh, did not go well. I think it was actually scrapped. There was a second version of the pilot program, uh, which uh, was not uh, very warmly embraced by, by solar developers, and I think with good reason. And now uh, there is a program that is uh, being developed by the utilities with the help, with the direction of DEEP and Pura. And it looks like it's going to be coming out sometime soon. Uh, it could be a very good program. Uh, it, it is very directed towards uh, low and moderate income subscribers. Uh, where essentially a larger facility is, is developed, a larger solar facility is developed, and then individual ratepayers who are not adjacent to that facility can buy subscriptions for the output. And it looks like it will be a good deal for low and moderate income uh, customers, uh, which will make up about 80% of the subscribers. Um, so it's, it's slowly coming out, but I'm not an expert on, on it. I don't know exactly. One, one problem with uh, the community pro uh, solar um, program is I think it's limited to 25 megawatts uh, per year for six years. So a total of 150. Uh, very soon, I hope that, that uh, we will need to and allow that, uh, that limit to increase. It's interesting to me because I, like many people in New England, you know, live on in a house that has a choppy roof line that is not really uh, well adapted to uh, individual solar. And, and I think about you know photos that I see from like Germany that every parking lot is covered with solar panels. Uh, New London City Council about eight or nine years ago actually rejected the idea of putting uh, solar panels over school uh, parking lots. Hmm. I, 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 and so I was just wondering, you know, how, you know, how that is proceeding because it does seem to make sense. Um, are there any programs for any kind of like neighborhood shared like geothermal? We have a couple of geothermal houses in New London that people, you know, retrofitted old Victorians, uh, made them energy star efficient. And um, it's always kind of in, been intriguing as something that could go hand in hand with, with solar. And I, I wondered if there's been any attention to doing that on more than an individual homeowner basis. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. So um, yeah, I'm not a, aware of that for the most part. Um, I mean, there's, there are different forms of geothermal and I'm just an observer um, of share. So the answer is going across property lines in general is a difficult thing to do. Um, I don't know all the regulations, but I know that it is a, a problem. It's one of the problems with creating microgrids that cross property lines and particularly that cross non-adjacent property lines mm. um, that use the distribution uh, infrastructure of the utilities to connect non-adjacent property owners to a, uh, a, a source of generation and perhaps a battery. Um, it's, it's a whole subject unto itself. So it's a long way of saying, no, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. That. All I know about it, we have friends who, um, you know, created a geothermal system in, in their old Victorian about 15 years ago. And they have told us the technology is much improved, but I don't know any more than that. So I guess um, my last kind of general thing I wanna talk about is, so if people are watching this 
and they want to know what they can do individu as individuals to uh, work on this, uh, what, what, what's available, how, how can they help? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, so I think that the first thing is, is to just learn more about it. Community power, because you have to have a better understanding of the power sector than most of us start out with, I mean, this has been an education for me. I'm not an energy professional. Um, and I had to, I wasn't even really aware when I started out on this that uh, delivery was a separate item on my bill than, um, than supply. Supply and delivery were different and had no idea once I noticed that why that was. Um, and so I think part of this is understanding this better. Um, and if you get in touch with me, I would be glad to send you some uh, articles that will get you uh, up to speed, but um, nobody understands this after one 25 minute presentation. It's, it's, this is an introduction. Um, once you do that, I think the next step is to uh, begin the discussion in your town. If you're part of, an en of a clean energy task force or energy committee, or green team or sustainability committee, some advisory board, um, bring it to that, bring it to them and say, let's, could we talk about community power, community choice? And, if, and I would be glad to do a, um, a, Zoom, uh, a Zoom presentation, probably pretty similar to this one. Uh, and so starting that discussion is a really important thing. Um, and I would be hoping that this could lead to a resolution of that advisory committee, first of all, to say, and I can provide a sample resolution uh, that's saying, we think that this is a pretty good idea. We'd like our legislators to take a look at it and we'd like the enabling legislation to be passed. And then we will take a second look, a even more serious look, but it's, uh, so that's, those are some of the steps. I think one of the benefits of engaging with community power or community choice is that you will learn a lot about the energy sector and other programs. I think that it binds together a lot of uh, what you read about. As you were talking, I couldn't help but wondering what kind of uh, zoning adaptations and code might be required uh, as part of this endeavor. And I don't have an answer. I don't know if you uh, have ideas about uh, what towns might have to change in their zoning codes, but I, I personally would be interested in that piece of it. Um, the other thing, um, I know that uh, you've been affiliated with Eastern Connecticut Green Action, and that group at least used to meet uh, at the Mansfield Library, you know, monthly, or um, is it still getting together? Can people, you know, still get involved with it? Oh, sure. Well, now I'm, I'm feeling a little embarrassed. Uh, Rona, I would have thought that, I, that you were on our, our, on our uh, mailing list because we've been, uh, you know, like many other groups, we switched to Zoom and we've been having monthly meetings. And uh, this uh, Saturday, uh, for example, we'll have Tim Ackert, who is um, uh, an Eastern Connecticut state legislator who sits on the Energy and Technology Committee. And he'll be talking to us about um, legislative priorities of the Energy Technology Committee and taking questions. Uh, and then we usually only have one presenter, but this month we'll have two presenters, so this Saturday. Um, and we'll be having Barry Kresh and Annalisa Paik of the uh, EV Club of Connecticut talking about what they, what they do. So it's a way, uh, it's kind of a way for people who are interested in these issues to learn something and to talk to each other and, um, you know, gain support. So I'm Please sorry. Please do put me on the list. <laughs> yeah, I thought you have my email fair. address and it's, it feels as though these days our lives are consumed with many uh, Zoom meetings and informational sessions. Uh, it's not all bad though, to be able to, uh, you know, hear from speakers who might not live right around the corner, who have insights that uh, might not be available, you know, right in, in, in your neighborhood. Um, 
I'm trying to think, and um, for town resolutions as well, I'm thinking that people can contact you to get uh, language and uh, and to ask if you would do a, a presentation. So that, that seems that like a, a good option for many towns. And uh, you know, this show, we put it on YouTube. Uh, Atlantic Broadband does broadcast to, um, you know, southeastern Connecticut, but also some of the north of Norwich area, uh, you know, Putnam and Plainfield and Volentown. Um, so it's available there, but also, you know, people are, are welcome to share it when we get it up on YouTube as well. You know, Rona, in, in, in mentioning Norwich, let me just uh, answer a question that I, I sometimes get, which is, uh, you know, what's the difference between community power or community choice and uh, um, the uh, municipal utilities that operate in places like Norwich and Wallingford and parts of Norwalk? Groton Some, in uh, our area as well. Pardon me? Groton in our in area Groton. as well. I think, there, I think that there are six uh, municipalities that have combined into the Connecticut Electric Energy Municipal Cooperative. So those are all municipal utilities that have formed into an organization. It's kind of like a, a joint power agency. And um, the big difference is that if I went back to, way back to the beginning, let me just go, oh, sorry to do this to your eyes. But if we went way back to the beginning, here, um, in that municipal utilities actually are exactly like investor owned utilities. They, they procure power over on the left they own and operate the distribution lines and they do uh, meter reading oh, yeah. and rate design and customer programs. Um, and some people have said, well, why don't we create more municipal utilities? And my response is that, first of all, you don't need to, to do a lot of the important things that a community power agency can do. Go out and, and procure your own power and do uh, customer facing services. The second reason is that it is really hard to create a municipal utility. Um, I think that in Massachusetts, for example, there are 40 or so. And I think that the last one that was created was back in the 1920s. And the reason is that let's just say that New London, where you are, or Mansfield, where I am, um, would like to create uh, municipal utilities. Well, we would have to buy all of the infrastructure from our in our local utility. Uh, and that is not a simple process. First of all, there's a lot of uh, negotiations which can go on for years and years and years uh, over what that price should be. And secondly, I think that it's a heavy political lift because it's one thing to ask town officials and town residents to take on community power. It's a whole nother thing to say, oh, and by the way, uh, we're going to have to uh, spend millions and millions of dollars to buy the infrastructure itself. So I think it's just not within reach and not particularly necessary. And I think governments sometimes do have a reputation for not doing the best job of infrastructure maintenance. Yeah. And also, also private utilities do not have the best reputation. Right that is before. true. Uh, so uh, it, that is, uh, it isn't just the purchase, you know, the maintenance of that whole distribution system right. uh, is, is daunting, which is uh, ultimately a good argument, I, uh, I guess, for decentralizing uh, the, um, you know, creation of the supply of, of power. Yes. Uh, again, you know, be, because we can see that in other states, this has worked, that community power agencies or community choice agencies are able to go out and procure power for the same as or less than uh, what the utility does. And, you know, one proof of this, first of all, you just, you know, you can go to and look at other states and you can go at, uh, look at reports from the, like from the National Renewable Energy Lab and from a number of universities. And uh, there's just no question that you can procure power for the same or less. Uh, but if you are a business here in Connecticut, and, um, you have the option, as we do as individual residents, to go out and buy power, probably through an aggregator, 
uh, from a competitive supplier. And the, the overwhelming number, overwhelmingly, if you're a larger commercial or industrial rate payer, you are going out and, get, and, and buying through somebody other than uh, Eversource or United Illuminating. And the reason is because you're, um, you're getting it cheaper. So the commercial and industrial power market um, proves that you can do better um, than the utilities. So if you have enough buying power, you really can uh, use that cloud to get better prices. You, but you have to sort of aggregate your demand. You know, and there's another issue that I didn't really mention, which is that um, I, as an individual residential rate payer, as I say, can choose between the, um, the uh, utility or a competitive supplier. I think that there are about, uh, don't quote me, but I think there are roughly a 20 competitive suppliers that are licensed to offer uh, uh, generation services to uh, individual rate payers in Connecticut, uh, residential rate payers. And there have been consumer protection issues with all of that. Uh, which you probably have read about. It's, again, it's a whole subject unto itself, but uh, the Office of Consumer Counsel and others uh, have been very unhappy with the behavior of some of those competitive suppliers. And one of the benefits of community power is that instead of you as an individual looking over or more likely not looking over the contract from a competitive supplier very carefully, and then finding that in the, in the fine print, that um, there are big penalties for um, canceling your policy if you uh, or con can canceling your contract, or that rates will go up. That you essentially had gotten a teaser rate. Um, that in forming a community power agency, uh, you don't do that alone. You do that with a bunch of other people and with some professional assistance. So yeah, so it, there is a protection in there uh, while retaining the flexibility of being able to buy either according to what's cheapest or what's greenest or you know uh, whatever other criteria you're, you're looking for. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, before I stop recording, uh, can you um, give people information how how they can sign into your Saturday Eastern Connecticut Community Action uh, meeting. Should they just email you to get uh, the Zoom link, or is it? Uh, is, that would be is the best thing to do. Just, just email me. Just email me, and I will send you the Zoom link. And would be glad to do that. And I can also put you onto the mailing list for. Uh, I put out a, a newsletter each week, which is a compilation of what I think are the five or six most interesting stories about clean energy issues here in Connecticut. So I, I don't deal with what's nationwide issues, um, but I'm concentrating on mostly clean energy issues here in Connecticut. Um, so you can get on that newsletter and then that newsletter will also have notices of the, um, of, of the meetings, but I can also put you particularly uh, if, if you're requested to put you on the Eastern Connecticut Green Action list, so you get a, an extra notice sometime in the week before the, the monthly meeting. Great. Well, thank you, Peter. Hopefully, you know, you'll be able to come back maybe in a year and we'll have a resolution here and everything is, you know, will have been taken a step or two forward. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, take care. Enjoy the day. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to speak with you and to everybody else who's uh, listened to this.